Hello, welcome to Alyssa Jean's Reviews. My name is Alyssa and this is my review for Star Trek Lower Decks Season 2, Episode 7, Where Pleasant Fountains Lie. I keep forgetting the name of that title. It's a very forgettable title name and I don't really get what it has to do with anything. But anyways, Where Pleasant Fountains Lie, Season 2, Episode 7. So I'll just jump right into my thoughts. Actually, first I should give the normal spoiler warning. If you have not seen up through the end of Season 2, Episode 7 of Lower Decks, then go watch it and then come back. All that stuff, blah, 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 etc., etc. Anyways, now let's jump into it with my feelings on the episode. So once again... Yeah, I mean, it was fine. Like, I mean, honestly, this episode didn't really do anything that pissed me off. I didn't think it did anything really bad. Um, I think it was playing it safe. You know, it was average. <laughs> like, it, it just it didn't do anything, yeah, that I thought was especially bad. But it didn't do anything that was especially good either. I think I said that for the episode a couple weeks ago as well. I just feel like um, it was fine. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fine. Um, but once again, I'm finding the humor lacking, um, or at least consistently. Like, I do laugh occasionally. I did laugh a, a couple times in this episode, but it's just too few and far between uh, for laughter. And I feel like that's kind of the theme of season two. I don't remember if that was a theme. Of, it might have been really a lot in season one, too, until we got to episode eight of season one. So I'm curious if it's going to pick up again in the last three episodes again this year. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was fine. And most of what I'm going to say here is going to be positive. Like, I don't have any major gripes with this episode. I just didn't think it was particularly funny or that it stood out, um, from any other episode. So, um, we've got two storylines, back down the two storylines instead of the three that they sometimes do. Um, and so I will start with the uh, Waxana Troy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Billups. I'm Billups' mom. <laughs> uh, also uh, tying into a Rutherford and Tindy storyline. Um, as far as Rutherford and Tindy side plots go, which you know I hate if you watch my channel, <laughs> this was fine. I actually more focused on Rutherford and had some nice moments between Rutherford and Tindy and really focused more on um, Billups and his mom, Loxana Troy. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, um, so it was interesting because it kind of, I don't know, it did that thing that Star Trek always does, um, especially early on in its series. It takes one of its characters, usually one of the bridge crew, and gives them a backstory, usually involving their family. Next Generation did that a lot, especially in the early seasons. Like, we saw everybody's mother or brother or sister or father or... <laughs> Or with Data. Data, we saw, like, his second cousin once removed. We saw everybody related to Data by the time the show was over. It's ridiculous. So um, it's very a Star Trek thing to do this type of thing and to, um, you know, show the backstory of somebody I quite frankly just thought was from Earth. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know that he was supposed to be from any particular planet other than Earth until this episode. I don't know if they've ever mentioned that before. Uh, but I actually found that the concept for his culture to be kind of interesting and funny at the same time. I mean, that they uh, are a space-bearing fantasy <laughs> uh, world. Like, they name everything of the dragons and uh, fantasy-related stuff. Uh, I forget uh, which scene it was. I think Rutherford was like... Uh, or uh, Billups was like, oh, so we're going to do the dragon converter or something. And and, Bill, and Rutherford was like, what? Oh, you mean the, the warp core or whatever? I don't, I'm getting all the terms wrong. Sorry. <laughs> but it was something along those lines. That was interesting. And that was kind of funny as well. Um, but yeah, his mom being another Roxanne Troy character, I gave him a pass for this one episode. Um, it was fine. 
didn't didn't have, I don't have any huge gripes with it. If we start seeing this character come back every season, uh, and then she starts hitting on I don't know I guess it wouldn't be Picard but like Ransom, <laughs> or she starts hitting on Boimler, or um, maybe later on she's going to like find her Odo to try to <laughs> marry. Maybe it'll be like Kayshawn or something. <laughs> if they you know let's not get too ridiculous with this. Like if it's this one episode is all we ever ever see her. I'm fine that of seeing another Waxana type of character because um, overall I actually found it kind of interesting and um, a little raunchy for Star Trek. I feel like Lower Decks uh, does get a little raunchier than the regular Star Trek does. I mean, as far as Star Trek goes, it's not like raunchy for like normal you know movies or like uh, an HBO show or something like that. But for Star Trek, I felt it's pretty raunchy and um i will say that i like that when bills was uh you know about to do the nasty it's with um you know a male and female character and just like whatever and um continuing to show that in the um, 24th century in the star trek universe you know being gay bisexual and eh, whatever like who cares <laughs> Um, and this actually started in Deep Space Nine uh, with the um, infamous um, lesbian kiss episode. But in that episode, um, it was just treated like, you know, the, the lesbianism was not really a big deal. It was more an issue that uh, Dax was having uh, an affair with uh, one of her former lovers from one of her former host bodies. Um, and you're, that's taboo in the, in the drill world um but the fact that they were both women was like yeah whatever who cares um so star trek is continuing to do that star trek is getting better i think about um you know being lgbtq plus uh inclusive um they're they're gradually getting better at that um i still need to see mariner follow up on what she said about how she's into females and non-binary and whatever and whoever Still need to see that, but <laughs> um, but I do appreciate this, and I do think it was kind of funny that you know he couldn't get it up, and so that's why uh, that's gave Rutherford that little extra second he needed to get there in time. Definitely very raunchy for Star Trek, but but uh, I think Lower Decks in general is willing to get a little raunchier than than um, any other Star Trek show. And you know what? I'm okay with it. I, I liked all that aspect of it. Um, and, you know, as I said, uh, the Loxana Troy ripoff, fine, don't want to see her again. Now, uh, as for Rutherford, um, I have been talking about how I wanted to see more Rutherford character development, and do we get it here? I mean, I guess I just still need to see more repercussions for his memory loss. We got that one episode two weeks ago, and that's it. So I need to see that that actually affected him in some way. Um, and I'm not seeing that in this episode, but um, it was mildly interesting uh, for his character, you know, that he kind of uh, had to force himself to step out of his comfort zone and kind of Tindy was there to um, help that along, help him step out of his comfort zone. And by the end of it, he was like super excited and really into it. Uh, so that's character growth. It's not, I guess it's not character growth I'm particularly interested in, but I guess I guess it qualifies as character growth. Um and yeah, the, the interactions between he and Tindy were not bad in this episode, especially since they were few and far between. And they were very meaningful when they did occur. So I wasn't bothered <laughs> by that. Uh, and it, as I said, really the storyline was more focused on uh, Rutherford than Tindy, and then even more so on uh, Billups and uh, Loxana Troy. Um, so yeah, the storyline is all right. As I said, it was fine. <laughs> Um, now uh, let me uh, hop over to uh, the other storyline and get into that a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about the Mariner and Boimler of it all. So, um, actually first I kind of want to talk about the uh, evil computer. Um, because I didn't actually catch that it was voiced by Jeffrey Combs. Like, I was listening to his... I was like, why does that voice sound so familiar? Who is that? And then I looked it up afterwards. I was like, 
Oh, it's Jeffrey Combs. I can't believe I didn't recognize it. I want to watch this episode again, actually, just so I can appreciate uh, the brilliance of Jeffrey Combs more because I love Jeffrey Combs so much. And I know that I really did love uh, this uh, computer, evil genius computer, um, but I didn't get to appreciate it for the fact that it was Jeffrey Combs. I was like, who is that? Sounds so, so familiar. So I need to go back and rewatch it so that I can admire Jeffrey Combs a little more. Um, but yeah, I especially like it at the end when it was, the, uh, <laughs> this is actually the funniest part for me. It was, uh, the ending sequence when it was just like, yeah, I'm taking over just when it's just complete hammy, like evil genius robot over the top. Uh, territory and then, and then uh, Boimler was just like you got boimed <laughs> I thought that was funny and <laughs> that um, <laughs> uh, no actually uh, I was stealing your battery just to make a distress call actually you're just hooked into the lights right now <laughs> and the funniest part when it when it was just like oh yeah I'm gonna blind you <laughs> flashing the lights at them. I think that was my favorite part of the episode. Uh, but I, I do need to go back and rewatch this and just appreciate it for the Jeffrey Combs of it all. Because <laughs> um, he was good, even though I didn't recognize who it was at, at first. And I love when they go to the Daystrom Institute, they put him in that uh, little box with all of these like hundreds of other <laughs> evil genius robots who are all going, oh, 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 yeah, we are going to take over the world just to um, emphasize just how many evil genius robot plots there have been in Star Trek, especially in the original series, um, but in the other shows as well. So I thought that that was a really great uh, parody of the, that trope. Um, I actually thought in the beginning that... Um, uh, it reminded me of the episode where they made fun of Landru last year, which was actually an evil genius robot that they had in the that was controlling a whole society, just like this one was in the original series. So at first I was like, wait, is this an episode I'm forgetting about? What episode is this from? <laughs> uh, then realized that no, it was not from a specific episode. It was just generally making fun of that trope. And that is my favorite aspect of this. Um, now getting into the Mariner and Boimler thing... Um, we have the very tropey crashing on a sh in a, on a, a planet together in a shuttlecraft um, that has been done a gazillion times <laughs> in Star Trek. Um, now, you know what? At first, I wasn't really sure. Um, once we got the reveal that Mariner had, um, you know, told Ransom to, to take him off of that centipede thing that he was really into um, and and give him that mission instead. I wasn't really sure which her motivations were. were. Like, would she just want to spend time with Boimler? Um, but it does make sense when you think about it. When you think about um, what she said in uh, season, or episode three, rather, uh, to Tendi about how um, she's just afraid that everybody's going to abandon her because she's been abandoned so many times, mainly because she doesn't care about um, advancing in rank, and other people do. So her friends will advance in rank and leave her behind, and she's uh, especially worried about this with Boimler, and she frankly should be because Boimler last week showed that, you know, he could be on a command path, and he should be. Um, and she's afraid of losing him, and so... She doesn't want him to go on a command path, so she's pulling him back. Uh, so that all actually did make sense to me when I thought about it. Um, I think where I had trouble with is the um, that Boimler would be able to be that convincing. Have that he was very very uh, conniving in this episode. Like he came up with a pretty uh, I would say convoluted plot. I don't know. I I don't think that he would. Especially in that situation where you're starving, you're like at your lowest. I mean, you can't function properly in that type of situation that he would be able to come up uh, with this plot and actually be able to do that good of an acting job and pretend that he was falling for uh, this, you know, Jeffrey Combs robots um, um, 
tricks, pretend that he was falling with it for it, but it was really knew what he was doing the whole time. I, I don't know that I buy that, <laughs> especially in the state of mind that he was in. It makes more sense that he was genuinely in a very uh, low state of desperation and would do anything uh, for food. It would make sense that he would fall for the, the trick. So I, I don't know. That was a little off for me. I don't, I don't think that I buy that. Uh, at all. Although I will add that it is kind of funny that the only food that they have is black licorice and everything tastes like black licorice. Um, personally, I don't hate black licorice. I don't love it either. I'm just generally not a candy person unless it's, there's chocolate involved. Um, so I don't really like any non-chocolate candy if I'm being perfectly honest, but I don't hate black licorice more than any other non-chocolate candy, <laughs> put it that way. But I know that a lot of people do. It's very popular to hate on black licorice. So it was kind of funny that um, everything tasted like black licorice to them. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that plot line was, was fine. I do think that the, the Evil Genius Robot uh, parody was, was the strength of this episode, for sure. All right, so... I think that's all I have to say about this week's episode. Let me go ahead and give you my rating. Ratinga out of 10. So one is the lowest possible score I could possibly give. 10 would be the highest possible score. I'm going to give yet another 7. This is a nice solid 7. Uh, as I said, uh, didn't do anything really bad and didn't do anything really to blow me away either. Um, although I did... I did enjoy the uh, Jeffrey Combs evil robot uh, parody, and I did enjoy that ending that I talked about before. But like that ending scene was really the only time I really laughed really hard in this episode, so it's hard to give it higher than a seven. Um, so it looks like kind of a I don't know, another mediocre season. I hope that they um, really can close off strongly as they did last year, but we will see. And I will be here next week to tell you what I think of episode eight of the second season so please subscribe click on the bell to get your own notifications and all that stuff and uh, i will see you next week